And this is a case studies, unique city approaches to EAB management with a QA and a um, portion at the end. And for this, we have three panelists that will be presenting here today. Um, the first one is Maria Friges. She is with the city of Shoreview, Minnesota. She has a BA in biology from the College of St. Benedict and is currently working toward a master's degree. She has worked at the city of Shoreview for three years as both an intern doing the EAB treatment program and as a natural resource, resource specialist. Her fields of interest are ecology, water quality, and connecting people to nature. She is passionate about the city's EAB program after having worked on both sides as a participant and as a manager. And so how we are going to approach this today is each person is going to be um, giving a presentation for about 20 minutes each. And at the end of that, we'll conclude with kind of a QA. and a um, So I will uh, introduce as well the, the other two speakers too ahead of time. Um, the next person that we'll have on this panel is Joseph Hansen. He's with the village of Wilmette, Illinois. He is an ISA certified arborist, municipal specialist, tree risk assessment qualified, and holds numerous certifications through the Tree Care Industry Association, including certified tree care safety professional. In his previous role as urban forester for the city of Park Ridge, Illinois, Joe was responsible for maintaining the urban forest through use of the city's urban forest management plan. Um, conducted parkway tree inspections, building plan reviews, assisted with managing contracts, and enforced the tree preservation ordinance. Joe is now the village forester slash tree preservation officer for the village of Wilmette, Illinois. He was recently elected the municipal director for the Illinois Arborist Association, and he is also a task specialist for the Urban Forest Strike Team in Illinois. He also produces a podcast called The Municipal Arborist, where he and guests discuss urban forestry and industry-related topics, which also provides ISA CEUs to listeners. And the last person on the pa panel that we'll have today is Michael Swanson. So Mike Swanson is with the city of Denver, Colorado. Colorado. He's a city forester and has worked for the city and county of Denver forestry for 21 years. And prior to that, worked at South Suburban Parks and Recreation District for eight years. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Northern Iowa and is currently in the Urban Forestry Graduate Certificate Program at Oregon State University. So, with that, I will go ahead and turn things over to Maria. Um, I'll just go ahead and stop sharing. Maria, you can, you have the, you have the screen. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you to everyone who is here and listening. Um, like Eric said, my, my name is, is Maria Frigis. I'm the National Resources Specialist for the City of Shoreview. I've been in this position for almost two, two years, but I was, in, I, I was an intern for the city for two years before that actually doing this program. So this is very near and dear to my heart and I always love to talk about it. It's always a blast. So I will be speaking about a current Amazon for uh, problem and the ways that the city of Shoreview is, 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 is managing it. Um, so for those of you who have no idea where Shoreview is, which I'm guessing most of you don't, Shoreview is located in Minnesota. Um, so it's the red Minnesota map there. And then we are located in Ramsey County, which is just north of the Twin Cities. It's in pretty much right kind of next to the, to the Wisconsin border down in kind of central Minnesota. And we are about 15 minutes north of Minneapolis and St. Paul. St. Paul is our state capital. So we're just, yeah, hop, skip, and jump right above that. Um, and Shoreview has a population of almost 27,000 people. So it's a decent sized city for Minnesota. So Emerald Ashmore was first discovered in Minnesota back in 2009. It was located in St. Paul. And then it was found in Shoreview in 2011. Um, it was found in one of our parks in the northern part of the city. And at this time, there really wasn't a ton being done with Emerald Ash Borer in terms of a bunch of options. Cities were either choosing to cut down all the ash trees, kind of like they did with Dutch Elm's disease and elm trees, and some opted to partner with a private company to offer treatment. Um, Shoreview did do a partnership for the first year, and then we decided to opt to, or to change our program to be offered uh, in-house. Uh, in but also at this point, I mean, I guess 
the technology available was decent. I mean, this had already been a problem in Michigan for, for quite a while. So we, we did have access to quite a few things. Um, and then as of last week, actually, uh, Minnesota now has 34 confirmed EAB counties out of the 87. So that's any county in that's highlighted in red, as well as green. The green ones are the ones that have been ha that have had it for, for quite a while, but some are brand, brand new to the situation. So we are still dealing with it here. So Shoreview, Minnesota has quite a few ash trees. Um, ash trees make up about 13% of our urban forest. We haven't had an entire, an entire tree uh, uh, in, in inventory done, sorry about that, since 2015, but we did have David Tree uh, do a public tree um, in inventory, sorry about that, in, in the winter of 2020. So this image shows all of our public trees and and the yellow ones are ash trees. So in total, we have about 108 uh, ash trees that are on public property. So this is anything in the right of way, in open spaces, and in our parks. Um, out of these 108 public ash trees, the city treats about 153 on parks and, and city-owned property. And then we actually only treat about 24 trees in the right of way. And this was data from our 2020 and 2021 treatment program. Um, this number does seem quite small compared to everything compared to the 100 and, or the, the 807. But because the city has so many public ash trees, the city does not have the staff or the resources to treat every single right of way ash tree. Instead, residents are given the option to, to treat a right of way to treat a right of way tree on their property, but the city does not pay for it to be done. And this, the residents aren't too big of a fan of that. And so they don't participate in the program. Um, the others don't want to spend the money to preserve something that, that, that they, they see is technically city property. And we have no idea how many private trees we actually have. Um, I have not been able to find much data from the 2015 survey that the DNR did, um, but from our treatment data in 2020 and 2021, which are the most recent like two, two, two year cycles, um, there were 753 private ash trees treated. So these are trees located in the front yard, backyard, and the side, the, the side, the side yards of, of properties. So after Emerald Ash Borer was discovered here in Minnesota and, the, and, and, and assessed, city staff decided that providing a treatment option would help mitigate the, dis, the dis, dis, disrupt, disruption to, to the urban forest. There were and still are a lot of high, val, high val, val, value ash trees that hold um, a significant value to residents. Rather than cut down every ash tree immediately, we hope to control the, the control the borer and remove smaller amounts of trees each each year. This would help keep much of the city's tree tri, tree diversity and give us the most amount of time to slowly re, to slowly replace the trees over time and spread the cost of re re removals over time as well. So right away in 2011, when it was discovered, we partnered with a private contractor to offer pricing to residents and we did negotiate that pricing. And after that, the city decided to source the treatment in, 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 in house. So actually purchasing the equipment and the chemical and then hiring staff to actually do the, the treatments. Emerald Ash Borer was also added to, the sh to, short, to Shoreview's disease tree or ordinance. This ordinance written in city code requires and enforces the, re, the re, removal of, of diseased trees to protect other healthy trees in the area. The ordinance allows staff to enforce both preventative and responsive trees and removals. So this would allow, this would allow park and, and right of way trees to be, re, to be taken down before they began showing symptoms of emerald ash borer and again, to spread the cost over time. Along with, re, along with the treatment and re, removal strategies, Shoreview Shore encourages residents to, re, to replenish the urban forest and with, with, with native species 
and and species di diversity. So that to do to to do this, Shoreview offers a tree sale, which where residents can purchase nursery wholesale trees at a from from a list that 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 staff choose, and then the list changes every couple of years to again get as much as much variety as possible. We also offer residents who have who've, who have had a right of way tree taken down. We offer them a re a re replacement tree to help the to help the the reforestation efforts and then we are also continuing to mo to monitor and assess and relash board here in the city so some challenges that we've had through this process one of shorey's first challenges is the timeline that, that that we actually take down these trees per city code and the ordinance that we have in place the city's contracted tree contractor has from December until April 1st to take down any disease ash trees that we staff mark. That, that, that timeline has worked really well in the past, but the number of trees the city marks each year keeps increasing, whether it's ash trees, oak wilt trees, whatnot. And kind of like I mentioned, they're not just taking down ash trees, it's Dutch elm disease trees, it's oak wilt trees, it's hazard trees, it's anything. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in a short amount of time. However, city staff are discussing the idea of opening the the opening the time the the timeline to um, to change it up for right of way and and front yard trees. Um, but the timeline would would still would, would still stay in place for any trees that are on private property more in, in the backyards and side yards. The Timeline challenge has kind of played into our pri our pri prioritization strategy as well. Recently, city staff have been having difficulties prior prioritizing areas. Some of this ha has to do with the, the the quantity of trees being taken down. Um, the rest of it has to do with staff time and resources. There's only two people in my department, and it's where this isn't the only thing we focus on. Um, when staff survey trees, we are often gauging the infestation level based on the symptoms we actually see. And this, this, this surveying is done in the fall. So if a tree looks still fine in the fall and shows minimal symptoms, we may leave it till the next year. Another challenge we've had is the environment. Uh, this last year, for some reason, probably because of the drought, a number of ash trees that looked perfectly fine in the fall or were showing minimal, minimal symptoms all of a sudden show, started showing intense EAD symptoms, mostly bark blonding. And that's really thrown us for a loop in terms of how we're going to manage it. Um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a challenge. Um, I personally think that we are also getting to a critical spot in the EAB death death curve here in short in here in Shoreview. Um, I think we're getting to the point where if people are not treating, the trees are going to be taken down. Um, another challenge that we've had to face is out, 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 outreach to residents. Despite all the the, the material that, that we do send out via letters or social media on our website. Those who are participating in the, 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 the in in the program, there are still a number of residents and businesses who have no idea that the city offers a treatment program, or or, or whether their their trees have EAB, what kind of trees they have at, in, in their property, and the residents from this group who don't know about this end up reaching out for treatment for for, for treatment in. in Infor information a little bit too late. They're doing it when they notice their tree isn't looking healthy, kind of like the image I have here on, on the right. And it's kind of the, the, uh, the problem of, if I don't see the problem, it isn't there kind of a thing. So a lot of residents are also seeing their tree looking perfectly fine, not wanting to treat it, and then start wanting to treat it when it's already starting to show symptoms and it may be too late to try and save it. Last thing is encouragement versus re versus requirement. City staff, like I mentioned before, can't treat every single every single right of way ash right of way ash tree. There's just far too many, so we leave it up to the residents if if they want to have a, a tree treated. 
Um, many think that it is the city's responsibility to treat every tree in the right of way. And so they don't wanna spend the money and therefore a lot of these trees are left to be taken down over time. When the resident does have a right of way tree taken down with, 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 the, with, with the program, the city does offer the tree again for replacement. However, only about 30% of residents actually take us up on this offer. So we're having a lot of trouble trying to get participation for reforestation efforts. Some residents just don't want trees on their property or they're just too much work. So looking back, I think there are a number of things we could have changed or improved on when we first started and things that we could even do now still. The biggest thing would be changing that timeline sooner. Uh, if we would open up the timeline to offer year, 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 year round take year round takedowns for boulevard or right of way right of way trees and easy access trees again like in, in the front yard we could have managed the 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 infestation a little bit better i think um, not accessible trees would still have kept the winter timeline for less risk to other trees in the area as well as less damage to properties However, every one of these challenges or these improvements looking back does have stipulations. We chose that timeline for a reason at the very beginning. And again, it has worked well kind of till this point. And this is when we are going to start needing to change it. Another change I would probably make is to have come up with a more concrete re, uh, strategy for re, for re, 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 Re removals. Sorry about that. I wish whether it be remove all right all, all right away ash trees in a certain spot, a certain area of the city, or to conduct a survey sooner, engage the health of all of, of all public ash trees would have been more helpful. However, this wasn't really an option at the time and still kind of isn't now due to again staff resources and just staffing time. Because we've we've we, we've been managing Emerald Ash Borer for so long, I think it would have been a cool opportunity to do some research projects. Again, time willing, and granted that there would be potential bias. Interns in 2020 actually decided to do a small research project looking at the treatment program's efficiency and tree health, and that actually benefited the city and changed a number of key aspects in our in our program. So it, it did help, and there is opportunities to actually do research, which would have been a lot cooler sooner. So collaboration, the city has been very, the city, I should say the city, the Shoreview City Council has been very supportive in the, since our Emerald Ash Borer has been found, they really agreed with staff, the staff's course of action, actions and really uh, uh, understood the, the, the threat of Emerald Ash Borer. Council members do ask for, for ask for, for, up, for updates each, each year, both on the, the treatment program as well as the trees that, that we are taking down each year. Um, costs for tree removals as well as the Emerald Ash Borer program and hiring the interns for the program are all budgeted for each are all but budgeted for each year. Each one is a separate line item under the forestry budget. Um, so staff are looking at the costs for re, for for treating for re for re re uh, re removals the costs of equipment and chemicals and all taking that in into uh, into into uh, um, view for basically for, for, for the next few years. Working with residents can be a little bit tricky and with residents I mean also homeowners associations for townhouses and bit and biz, biz, businesses. So we staff often go out and meet with property owners. Um, whether it's looking at their ash trees, looking at any other tree on the property and providing options for them. Uh, if, 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 if the tree is, is to be taken, taken down in the fall, we will actually send out a certified letter giving them some, some information as to why their tree is being marked or forced to be taken down, as well as providing a quote from the city's contractor. Property owners have the option to choose if they want to use the city's, con the city's quote, or if they want to, to, to go out for private bids. If a property owner chooses to use a, pri a private contractor, 
the tree has to be taken down um, or at least scheduled to be taken down by the end of, G of December. Staff will go back out in January to see if, if, it, if it has actually been done. If not, we, we will contact the, contact the property owner and if we hear no answer, the work will, will be given to the city's contractor and the cost will be charged to the property owner's property taxes. If the property owner chooses to use the city's, con city's contractor, uh, the city will pay for the, re for the removal originally and then we, we will invoice the resident later on. Um, and all, delin all, de all delinquent work orders are charged to the, to the resident's property taxes. For, public, for, pub, for trees marked on, on public property, the city actually covers the cost of that, because again, technically city property. And for tree, for tree, for treatment options, uh, the city residents do have the option to, to, to use the city's program, uh, where again, our staff, our staff will actually go and assess trees, give them a, a quote. When the resident bit pays, then we'll actually go out and treat and then send Remind, remind, reminders late, 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 later for when their cycle is, is is up again. But residents can still use a private contractor, and we don't have anything to to do with that. They, they can they can schedule that um, on their own. And then I will note just one thing: all private con private tree contractors here in Shoreview are are required required re required to, to be licensed and this is just to ensure that the companies have insurance and are bonded in case anything happens um, and this is done each year and with any with if, even if this if even if the, com the company is doing just trimming work or disease pre disease pre prevention it's always just good to have it be done that's about it for my stuff. I do have my contact uh, in, in information here. Sorry about that. If anyone has any questions about more details about our program or how we handle things, feel free to reach out. I know Eric can definitely send this, send this, this out as, as well. There's definitely a few things I did not cover that I love to talk about, but this is fine too. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Yeah, it's uh, I'll just say real quickly, it's it's a really cool, comprehensive program. I think it's a really unique thing that I've uh, you know seen compared to kind of other cities. So um, absolutely, if if anyone is interested in this, uh, definitely take down Maria's information. Um, and with it, so uh, what we'll do is um, we'll have the other presenters present and then we'll take all the questions kind of toward the end and especially some of the ones that are toward specific individuals um so thank you for that maria that was great and so the next person i have on here is joe hansen um joe the uh the screen Hello. is yours hey joe all right thanks appreciate it thanks thanks for uh, asking me to join uh, i'm glad to hear and talk to be here and talk about this um, I am going to talk a little bit differently um, than kind of most people talk about this. And the reason is I kind of wanted to share with you opportunities to kind of change, um, to kind of change your protocols. And instead of viewing it as a, a huge loss. Um, let's let's maybe kind of flip the script a little bit and take advantage of some of these newer opportunities that we have uh, presented with us, and not just like species diversi diversification, uh, diversification, excuse me, or uh, education, etc. Um, but yeah, I'll walk you through it. I'm just going to talk a little bit of a brief history about uh, EAB Management in Park Ridge, Illinois. Um, Park Ridge is a suburb of Chicago, located in Cook County, Illinois. Um, Chicago is actually a southwest border of Park Ridge. Um, to give you kind of an idea of size, uh, it's about 38,000 residents and nearly uh, 15,000 housing units, uh, a little over seven square miles and 126 miles of roadway to give the Public Works guys here a uh, picture of what it is that what we're dealing with. <clears throat> that's not road miles either, that's just, you know, roadway. Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, facing southwest. 
Uh, it's Tree City USA, has been for about 38 or 39 years, I believe. I uh, have a very uh, comprehensive tree preservation ordinance in the city. There's been a city forester on staff since the 60s and some sort of tree inventory ever since then. Obviously back then we didn't have tablets and smartphones, it was all on paper and they were pulling index cards out of little mini drawers. What a headache, huh? Um, so back before that, while everyone was freaking out about what they were gonna do about it, this is kind of what I was doing and it was what a lot of people in this area were, were doing. Um, so yeah. So prior to my role as the urban forester for Park Ridge, I worked for the uh, Cook County Forest Preserve District. Um, and the Cook County Forest Preserve District managed uh, about, I think it's 78,000 acres of land. It's one of the largest forest preserve districts uh, in the country and the oldest for certain. And uh, with all that land came, you know, many different picnic groves, roadways, parking lots, and trails, uh, specifically nearly or over 300 miles of managed trails. Um, so their approach was removal. There's no way that they were able to treat everything. And uh, a lot of even municipalities just didn't have those types of funds. Um, moreover, in this region, uh, at the time when uh, EAB was first discovered in the Chicago region, which I believe was about 2006, um, we were still kind of unsure about treatment options. So, um, we kind of let the infestation grow, you know, unfortunately. And um, by the time uh, Dr. Miller was the was the was doing a lot of research uh, with treatment options at that time, as Rainbow was, I know. Um, and most of the cities or villages uh, opted for removal, unfortunately. So um, that's where I learned about this was felling them and removing them, right? Um, so, uh, this is a picture of what is left in Park Ridge, which is about 155 trees of 2200, which is, you know, a pretty, pretty astounding number. Um, give you, give you an idea here. So what we're looking at here is a, is a park district, uh, abutting a roadway. So here in Illinois, uh, which is different than many states, park district is separate from municipal government. Well, it's a separate level of municipal government. So in our case, it was the city of Park Ridge, and then there's the Park Ridge Park District. There's separate taxing bodies, separate legal municipal entities in the state of Illinois. So our management plans are different. But um, Park Ridge used to have a elm population of over 60% or something like that, American elm population. And obviously when DED came through, we needed something to replant. So what did we replant? Just kind of like everybody else, we followed the same uh, the same line of thinking. We planted a bunch of ash and you know a bunch of pear and maple, et cetera. So at the time of EAB management, when it really started becoming like, oh no, we have a problem here. What are we going to do? Uh, this is what the population looked like. So uh, our tree population was approximately a little over eleven percent ash, and um, that's basically the breakdown of the inventory, which was done seven years prior. So that would have been about 2003 or 2004 with these numbers. So some of these size brackets that you're looking at may have been a little bit different uh, by the time uh, the city forester, Tony Glide at the time was actually looking at these numbers. Um, so a lot of these park trees, we actually ended up saving and, 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 and treating, okay? Um, some major cliff notes for what happened with us. Uh, we did a full inventory uh, with Davey between 2012 and 2014, and that was at a cost of approximately $80,000. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the inventory because the inventory thing is important. I think a lot of people understand this, but necessarily don't always follow through with it. And that's that once you get an inventory, 
you're, you're getting it for a purpose and it's to manage trees. So in our case around here and for the industry, the inventory industry was uh, we got to figure out where these ash trees are. So we know how much it's going to cost to potentially treat them or remove them and, you know, assess, assess risk, right? Unfortunately, after the ash high blew through here, most municipalities didn't continue to update their inventory. So that's a huge misstep and that's for, for a variety of reasons. And I'm not going to really dig too deep into that, but that's something that, you know, we should really think about um, once we have an inventory. Let's let's utilize it more past uh, managing the, the ash population. Uh, the city started removing high risk trees in 2011. Uh, there was some sort of federal uh, grant involved there. And the majority of them were moved between 2012 and 2016 at a cost of approximately $1 million. So that $1 million included uh, removal, stump removal, and site restoration, which in our case is just grind the stump, topsoil, grass seed, it's up to the property owner to water it. Um, that inventory data that we collected included all the usual suspects, location, species, diameter, condition, recommended maintenance, and the benefits. Now, the way that we took this inventory is it's not just inventory software, dots on a map telling us where the trees are located, what species they are, what size they are, what benefits do they have. It's also um, a work management software that allows us to track everything. So resident calls and says, hey, my ash isn't looking great. Can you come take a look at it or whatever the species is? Um, we go ahead and enter that into the work management uh, side. And then we go out there and record our notes in there. So what we have now is data for years and years and years of data of inspection requests. We have names, phone numbers, tons of different notes. So we it, it's incredibly invaluable. And then also tied with that is like all the budgeting stuff. And it's also important that we can share, you know, reporting information uh, to our stakeholders, right? And in this case, I'll just share a couple of them. This is from last year, all of 2021. Uh, there were 777 requests of service. We reviewed 562 tree removal permits. We removed 521 parkway trees, which I'm gonna get into that in a minute too. Um, once ash stopped, our tree removals did not stop, unfortunately. Um, and we planted 517 parkway trees. We pruned 254 trees off cycle. Uh, we have a seven year, or when I was in Park Ridge, I, don't, I keep saying we, I'm not there anymore. I guess I'll just keep saying we uh, had a seven year uh, cycle prune. And then also here's, you know, the benefits uh, on the right here, you'll see the big uh, calculated benefits, big blown out number. Then also you can click on individual trees and see what those individual benefits are, which is hugely important. Uh, so in about 2020, I knew that we weren't spending all of our budget for um, uh, the per, uh, elm inoculations. So, and I knew we had about 200, 220 ash trees at that time. So I used our inventory, ta-da, and went out and evaluated all 200 and something ash trees. Now, these weren't like high level inspections. These were just quick level one, in, in many cases, windshield surveys. And with that, I determined, you know, trees that needed to be removed, a couple that needed pruning, and then which trees we could treat potentially. And then since we have an up-to-date inventory, prior to well let me back up for a second prior to every single cycle prune we update our inventory zone which gives us up-to-date numbers and what that means is we're basically never more than six or seven years out of date depending on which zone we're looking at okay so with that we can calculate uh, dbh right we know pretty much plus or minus one to two inches uh where we're at dbh wise so in this case what we're looking at here is the bid table for uh, elm and ash inoculation. And um, you can see that we had estimated we were gonna treat 70 trees in 2021, but based on that survey, we ended up doing 722. And per this contract, we're paying $4.55 an inch. And to treat those 72 ash, that, that's all that we're paying. Now granted, part of the reason that that price is like that is because we're also treating you know, uh, 140 ash trees at a cost of nearly $56,000. So you get that quantity breakdown once you start getting into those bigger numbers. But in retrospect, what this, these costs, obviously these costs weren't like this back in 2011, but now, and what, what, and why this is beneficial to you is 
you you know if you're ahead of this what what you're looking at much better than we did 10 years ago when we were staring down the barrel of a gun essentially and then an, another thing that i like to add is down south downstate illinois they are getting decimated with this and they have known about it obviously twice as long as as we have but they didn't you know unfortunately for a number of different reasons didn't have the ability to 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 kind of get ahead of it and decide what they're going to do um, so with all those tree removals, right, comes the problem of how are we going to plant all of these trees? Uh, we had initially uh, a lot of difficulty finding the trees. And a lot of the problem with that was uh, our bid process. Um, and we have something called a suburban tree consortium here in uh, El northern Illinois. And what it is, is it's basically a collective of a number of different nurseries who provide uh, quantity pricing if you order through the consortium. So that's really cool, uh, except the way that our, again, the way that our procurement policy works is by the time that it, it, the, our procurement policy and our, um, bu our budget, we're on a fiscal year. So by the time we went through council to get the approval, everyone had already swiped in and got all the, all the good trees. So now we're trying to source five or 600 trees from you know two, three, four different nurseries. It becomes a huge hassle, right? So uh, Brandon Nazer, the city forester, had a kind of what I think is a re revolutionary kind of idea, at least for around here, was why don't we get a contract with the nursery, right? So we ended up signing a five-year contract with the nursery, which gives the nursery the ability to plan ahead, and it eases the plan ahead as far as species planting and what we want. And then also it really streamlines our planning process and for, for reforestation. It also gives us great uh, quantity pricing, again, that planning thing. And then we go out to the nursery, obviously, and inspect each tree prior to harvesting. And as you can see in this picture, we only select the highest quality trees. Yeah, uh, that ended in 2021. And we recently signed another five-year uh, contract with them. And the reason is the number of uh, maples that we're losing extensively. So this is what it actually looks like out in the nursery. Here's some nice uh, poplar trees. And yeah, so that's that's that. Uh, this is kind of like an, a quick little table that I made showing a couple different key species that we like to plant um, and how that breaks down. So the Suburban Tree Consortium, you can see for that ginkgo was 257. Our five-year contract was 239.90. So these are two-inch ball and burlap uh, trees that we're talking about. And you can uh, imagine spread out over five years we're saving significant money. I think we're at savings at about twenty-five thousand um, dollars overall, which you know, in the grand scheme of things, isn't a huge amount of money. But that's a, a lot, a, a large, a, a ton more trees that we're able to plant uh, because of that. So back to this inventory data that we were unfortunately blessed with, yet blessed with, uh, I, we're able to know that this is what our species breakdown looks like in the city currently. And you can see that the uh, maple, just like a lot of uh, municipalities around here, is uh, disproportionate and it's not something that we really like to see. And unfortunately, this is kind of what we're looking at right now and super high mortality rate in uh, sugar maples, uh, then Norway maples. And that's why we're near that 500 tree removal per year. It's just, we have this large population um, some of it is aging. As you can see, these trees haven't really, you know, obviously matured out yet in this case. Um, but we're dealing with what was a terrible drought in uh, 2012, followed by, you know, harsh weather shifts. And then again, as, as all of you know, we're dealing with these uh, parkway issues where we have compacted soil. You know, we live in the Midwest, so we're, you know, using a lot of ton of, ton of salt and uh, dealing with pollution. And then obviously, you know, plopping these things next to driveways and sidewalks doesn't help much either, doesn't aid to that cause. So again, our, our um, removals have not slowed down really much at all. And we've kind of become in this, in this hole, right? So we lost 2,200 trees and then we've been removing 350 to 500 since then, since at least 2017, and it's it's really like, it's really unfortunate, but, you know, hopefully we can all kind of learn from this because I don't think, you know, most municipalities have these all similar, similar types of issues, right? And uh, I read an old newspaper article that Tony Glyatt, the previous city forester in Park Ridge, quoted, 
And he basically told city council ahead of EAB, like, look, you know, we're, we are in a really terrible situation here. And not just because of EAB, because we also have this aging out canopy of old mature trees. And then the other thing to kind of think about is, you know, a, a lot of these trees that they planted, you know, 60, 75 years ago, the conditions were much different. The weather conditions were different. The weather patterns were different. Um, there was less, far less construction impacts. And then also we've been compacting the soil further for the past, you know, 75 years. So a lot of the trees that we're planting now, no matter how hard we try, probably are not going to reach the same level of like, you know, 50 plus inch diameter elms that, that we were seeing lining our streets back in the 60s nice cathedral roadways you know so um here's another shot of the norway maple issues obviously with the uh with the girdling roots um but yeah basically the the, the gist of it is that i kind of really wanted to drive home and i hope i did a little bit is that though we faced this crazy unheard of thing and it's really odd that i kind of lived through it in the middle sort of, and then at the end, because obviously I wasn't planning for any of this when I was coming up. Um, I didn't know really much about it. I was just another person in the general public. But once I came into it, I was just doing the removals. And then once I got out of the field, I was managing how how can we treat these trees and you know assessing their risk and kind of learning learning from that. And I think what's important that to, to look at is that, uh, excuse me, I think what's important to look at and remember that is that let's not forget like what, what we're given. So if we get a grant to do an inventory, let's, let's use that to further and better manage what we have so we can continue to let it thrive, uh, you know, the best, the best that it can. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much all I have. Um, I hope to answer some questions at the end. I'll throw in real quick. Um, again, that I have a podcast called The Municipal Arborist. I have a ton of different municipal folks on, and we talk about a lot of these types of issues and just managing the urban forest. So if you want to learn more, check that out. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to shoot me an email at any of those two email addresses, and I would be happy to uh, answer your questions. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, and yeah, everyone on here, I'd highly encourage you to, to reach out to Joe, um, especially since he does have that podcast and specifically around municipal arboriculture. So things that you, know, you may be encountering in the field or things that you might have questions about are probably something that others have questions about as well. And so great opportunity to, to reach out, ask questions, and then you know hopefully get the industry talking about some of that. So the next speaker that we have is Michael Swanson. Uh, hello again. Uh, I am Mike Swanson, Denver, Colorado. And this is Denver's EAB journey. And I say that because we're still on it, which uh, I believe uh, <clears throat> many municipalities are still on theirs. But we have not found EAB yet in Denver. Uh, it is two miles away, but we'll get into that. Um, so journey begins 2013. Um, EAB was found in the city of Boulder, uh, September 23rd in 2013. I think it took every, I think, I think, uh, around here, we, we always look towards the horizon towards the East, so to speak. And I think we all knew it was coming, kind of coming our way, but I think it kind of caught a lot of people off guard at the time. Um, Denver actually put a moratorium on planting ash back in 2017, though even to this day we find ash trees that are about uh, three, four, five inches in caliper, so we know they were planted after the moratorium. Um, after uh, EAB was found in Boulder, a federal quarantine, Boulder County, uh, was started. It lasted about six years, and basically it gave uh, municipalities time um, to get their plans in place. And so basically it uh, slowed the spread of EAB uh, throughout the front range of Colorado. And also at that time, the Colorado Emerald Ash Borer Response Team was created. And uh, for the most part, 
it assisted all the communities in Colorado, but for the most part, my understanding is it assisted uh, the mid-sized and the smaller communities uh, for the most part. And uh, um, if you can see it, uh, there are some of the partners that were part of that uh, effort. Uh, this is just a graphic showing the progression of EAB along the front range of Colorado. Um, if you can see my cursor, I'm not sure if you can or not, this is Boulder. And then it kind of moved this way, this way, but then all of a sudden we started finding it south of Boulder. And this is where it was found out in Arvada in June of 2020. And this is Denver. If you can, again, can see my cursor. So then at the, on, uh, on the onset of, uh, EAB Denver um, for our parks and parkways publicly maintained trees we had about 7600 or 76,000 trees with about 60 or about 6200 ash trees in our parks and parkway system private property trees there was a urban heat uh, island analysis done in 2013 um, that stated we had about you know actually 2.2 million trees uh, in Denver and 290 were on private property, 290,000 on private property. Now this is, this is uh, kind of interesting for the next slide. Public right-of-way trees, we have about 209,000 trees. Again, this is when um, the inventory wasn't quite done, um, um, about 75% done. And it, uh, we had identified 26,000 ash trees at the time along public right-of-way to back up slightly. In Denver, even though uh, the trees on the public right of way are city asset, uh, per ordinance, um, the abutting property owner is responsible for the maintenance and care of those trees. Resource now, so just currently, uh, publicly maintained, uh, maintained trees, again, parks and parkways, we have 79,000 trees, so it's already changed because uh, the numbers I on the previous slide was uh, when the inventory again was not completed. 79,000 trees with, with 4,800 ash. And now the 4,800 um, is actually from flome reduction. And that come, came from the SLAM program, which it seems to be a very popular uh, uh, point of conversation today. Uh, private property trees, I still use the 1.9 million trees. But what's important is through our inventory, we only identified 15,000 ash trees in private property. Uh, I do suspect there's more, um, but that is what the inventory said. Uh, public right away trees, 209,000. Well, it's really 229,000 trees with about 28,000 ash along the public right away. From the start, Denver was very proactive. So once we found and heard and uh, the, my predecessor talked to Boulder and uh, we, we got going um, and they, uh, we had very, um, very mindful, very, um, we had the forestry management at the time was very, um, very long, uh, vision oriented. And we started a steering committee in 2014. And that steering committee lasted for two years. And this is just a list of the folks or the organizations that uh, we had part of that steering committee. Uh, some of the key recommendations of that uh, uh, committee was public, uh, public education will, would be key. Uh, pesticide treatments uh, will be supported. Uh, for qualified trees. So uh, we currently still use the ninth edition of the appraisal guide. And uh, so qualified trees would be like good or uh, excellent trees in that, uh, given that condition, those condition ratings. Public right away trees should be replaced by the city. Again, what I said that uh, that's not really our practice, but that was the recommendation of the steering committee. Uh, the city should encourage the replanting of trees on private property which you will see in, uh, in the next few slides, we, we do. And uh, there, there needs to be a plan developed for repurposing our wood residue. And now at the time of the steering committee, a steering committee, we were, uh, we were effectively um, mulching uh, most of our urban wood residue, and which we still do, but we're actually talking about getting the logs and wood in hands of craftspeople or, you know, tradesmen, et cetera, et cetera. 
the guiding principles that which came out of the steering committee was one educate again uh, awareness of the infestation and how to identify an ash i mean uh, I mean, I know we're all foresters and practitioners, but there's a lot of people out there that um, do not know what an ash looks like. Uh, act would be number two, care of ash within the public space, that's parks and parkways. In some cases, the public right away, yet uh, homeowners, uh, per ordinance again, homeowners are always responsible for the ash in the private property. Uh, sustain. Ash uh, not removed will be treated and new trees will be planted to maintain the current level of the urban um, tree canopy, which is uh, currently 13%. But at the time of the steering committee, uh, it was gauged to be around uh, 18%. So during the steering committee, a um, uh, few, few of the staff took a trip. They took a trip to Milwaukee and Chicago and Madison to find out how those communities uh, manage the AB. What did they do? How did they find out? What are they doing now? Um, what was the takeaways from their experiences at that time? Uh, I believe this, uh, this, uh, this trip happened in 2015. And we, it wasn't just the city forester at the time or the regulatory manager, but also there was a um, Colorado State Forest uh, Forest Service entomologist was aboard, a council member, a person from the um, mayor's office of sustainability. We had a market, marketing uh, individual on, on the trip. So we had a, we, we brought uh, the trip brought in a lot of perspectives on how uh, on how EAB could be addressed. And that trip was so successful. Well, let me back up. So the takeaways to the Midwest trip was, uh, what do you have? So inventory, uh, which has already been mentioned today, plan early. Uh, we took that in Denver, obviously, and ran with it. Learn from others. Involve many. So we cast a wide net and our stakeholders, steering committees, just involve as many people as you possibly can. Act early and make a decision. Treat, remove, or whatever hybrid is. You know, at the time in 2014, 15, 16, I mean, we had the information we had at the time. Now it's been, what, uh, six years, seven years? We have more information now. And also have the end in mind. What about the waste stream? What are you going to do with the urban wood residue? So again, Denver was proactive. The preferred plan is right here. I know you can't read it, but I put it up there anyway. But what it did uh, produce was $2.6 million, $2 million was injected to our general fund for treatment, for replanting, for an educational campaign, and for some limited term employees. And again, the plan. We in Denver took SLAM and again, ran with it. And that's how we basically created our plan. Initial overall plan 2016, uh, uh, in parks and parkways treat 500 ash trees long-term. So they'd have to be, I think I saw the a term earlier today, heritage trees. Um, practice phloem reduction, removing food, removing trees that need to be ash trees that need to be removed anyway because they're dead, poor, very in uh, very poor condition, and then also increase their annual planting uh, by 26 percent. Public right away. Um, again, this is the initial plan. Treat 5,300 ash trees that were uh, greater than 12 percent DBH and, or and or. Uh, and were in fair or better condition and also plant uh, approximately 3,800 trees each year for 10 years. And then also a very successful program, which I uh, will not delve into much. Uh, you can always look online. Our Be a Smart Ash program public awareness campaign was launched. We were able to create its own site within the city, which we can't do anymore. And also we, um, we really pushed the social media presence. Uh, all this we still use today. Over, over the overall plan 
since 2016. So on parks and parkways, in the past six years, we've treated uh, 8,500 uh, ash trees. Um, I say four-year cycle, but uh, uh, I think Rich Wilson is on this call. He's our uh, plant health care uh, supervisor. Uh, it's like year one, we'll uh, trunk inject 500 trees and bark ban 1,500. Then year two and three, we'll simply bark ban 1,500 trees. And then on year four, we'll bark ban, uh, we'll get back to the inject injecting of 500 trees and bark ban um uh, 1500. Um, so we do that on a four year cycle. Phloem reduction, we removed uh, about a thousand trees, ash trees. And then we've also increased, uh, well, over six uh, years. So we've, we've increased our planting by almost 1800 trees um, over the course of six years. Uh, public right away, we have treated thus far 15,000 trees. These are on a three year cycle. So we're on cycle. Uh, seven, I believe, currently, and we've also planted almost 11,000 new trees along the uh, public right-of-way. And the public awareness campaign, um, very successful educational tool, very successful uh, social media presence, and it, it, and it created a standalone website, like I mentioned, which we cannot do anymore. Uh, I wanted to stick this slide in here. I'm kind of racing, as you can tell, because I think we're, uh, I want to make sure there's time for questions and answers. But I want to stick this um, uh, slide in here because this is exactly what we're doing today. We're doing ad adaptive management. So you make the plan, you implement it, you monitor it, you fine tune it, and, you so, and then you evaluate it. So you just keep doing that. But notice the new data in there. That's what we're doing today. Keep learning. Um, I uh, made a couple notes about a few things I heard today that I had not heard prior. So this is very important. If you haven't made a plan yet, or if you're in the midst of a six year plan like we are, keep adapting your management. Changes and needs, parks and parkways. Uh, just a couple of days ago, again, Rich Wilson uh, told me that he was not gonna bark band any ash trees over 24 inches uh, in diameter. Um, he says it's not effective, it's not efficient. Again, I think I heard that this morning. So we're actually doing, uh, we're gonna um, put the money towards more trunk injections. And also we are working on a wood, uh, wood reutilization repurposing plan. Um, again, like I mentioned, we do mulch our residue currently, but we need to get this wood into other people's hands so we can prolong the, the life of these ash trees even after removal. Public right away, uh, we initiated the GAP uh, planting program, which is all ash trees of that were are dead, very poor or in poor condition. We will go in and remove these trees, stump grind these trees, and then uh, the replacement plants will be an opt-in, opt-out uh, part of the program. It's all free. So we're just trying to diverse, diversify the UTC and we're just trying to get ash and, uh, and, and ash off the right away. And then public awareness uh, campaign, this is an interesting one. While BASA is still uh, very popular and it's been kind of ingrained in the culture in the past six years, um, while it's still EAB centric, we are pivoting um, to include more general tree care, um, protect, preserve, and renew. So even though BASA will still, or Emerald Ash, ash Spore will still be the underlining message um, how to and plan and how to manage that we are again pivoting uh, because there's Emerald Ash for fatigue out in Denver and basically a lot of people have told me find it already we're tired of hearing about it let's get moving forward which is probably a little strange for some, to, for some of you to hear takeaways again this goes back to the the trip to the Mideast uh, do an inventory that's been mentioned already plan early, learn from others, uh, involve many, involve as many stakeholders as you can as you create your plans. Act early, make a decision. Are you gonna treat? Are you gonna remove? Are you gonna do a hybrid? Always renew, always replace in some, in some form of fashion and always have the end in mind. Uh, the waste stream, be sustainable. Um, this should be kind of a circular economy uh, in, our, in our profession, so. Um, 
and other than that, I want to thank you. If you uh, if you want my uh, contact information, you can surely put it in the chat because I've obviously forgot to put on uh, <laughs> not on the screen. So anyway, thank you very much. Cool. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. If the other panelists want to hop on the screen, then great. Well, th thank you all, all three of you for um, you know doing this presentation, and for everyone else, uh, this kind of provides some unique perspective. Um, you kind of have people representing areas with Maria under high you know, EAB infestation currently right now. With Joe, it's kind of it's kind of hit that peak and so they're on kind of the back end of things and for mike over in denver um there's still it's kind of that hurry up and wait to get it here um right now and so it's kind of a unique perspective in all of those right now um so we'll do so if anyone has any questions feel free to go ahead and pop them in the q a portion on here but i'll just go ahead and uh, read through a couple of these that popped up in some of the other presentations um first one is for you maria Said so after ash, do you have another species that is dominant in Shoreview that you will be strategizing for next? Strategizing for uh, we're we're trying to figure that out. Um, the, the next two high density trees would be spruce and maple, and then oak. Um, and really, with I mean, this is the only disease tree that we really everything else with those like maple and spruce. There are diseases, there are things that come up. However, it's it's not one specific thing, kind of like emerald ash borer. Um, with maples, it's kind of getting to be that point with gen, with a uh, gen, general maple decline and then uh, verticulum wilt. However, it hasn't been a huge problem yet. So, if anything, it's more if residents can contract with 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 private contractors. We're not really we're keeping an eye on it, but we I haven't been seeing a ton of stuff yet for it. Yeah, well, and then, uh, you know, with you see in the case for, for Joe over at uh, Park Ridge, what is it like? It, it, so it was 40 something percent maple out right there. Um, all we yeah. need is one, one, one uh, you know, maple borer to come through, and we have the same thing come through. <laughs> um, and additionally, too, you know, Maria was talking about, uh, you know, spruce is a commonly planted tree uh, here in the Twin Cities. That's where I'm at as well. Um, but for, for Mike, your, your Colorado blue spruce do so much better in Colorado than they do here. <laughs> you know, just the plethora of issues with rise of spear and various needle casts that uh, come with it. So that's always fun. Well, in Colorado, actually, there's an issue with, uh, um, well, because we're uh, limited in our water resources here. Um, we have issues, uh, blue spruce with uh, reuse water. Oh. So we're kind of working through that. That's kind of our new EAB, I, I, I guess I could add. <laughs> <laughs> Always something. It's fun. Um, this next question is for Joe. Have you done any canopy studies in Park Ridge over the years? Seems with EAB and the high concentration of maple, it may be a great way to plead your case for more resources. Yeah, so um, the Morton Arboretum and the federal government funded a canopy analysis back in 2011 or 2012. And that you can actually go to their website if you want to learn more information about that. It's a Chicago Region Trees Initiative. <clears throat> you can Google that. I think it's chicagorti.com or something. And right on the front page, you can actually look at their canopy analysis. And uh, But basically, that actually will break down from the the north uh, northeast Illinois area all the way down to the county level and then down to each municipality and you can click on each municipality and it breaks everything down in a really cool concise manner uh, but anyways they just released another one that was done uh, in 2020 and I think it was released at the end of last year or early this year I forget exactly where we can compare the numbers so it was really interesting because the canopy analysis was the first one was done right as ash was like hitting hard right and we still had a lot of these million like millions and millions of ash tree in the area so we we're able to kind of look at the at the numbers of what had happened since then and um we at that time in park ridge i believe we're at 43 percent canopy cover and i believe now we're at a 41 percent canopy cover um in addition to that we have paid extra for a separate utility for a tree keeper called canopy 
which breaks down uh, basically um, different zones. So you can add in any kind of layer that you want. So we have our cycle prune zone in there as a layer. And then there's another layer, which is something to do with uh, the census. I forget exactly what it does. And it has a number of different filters where you can kind of slide the filters and you can look at um, you know, potential canopy cover, current canopy cover, and then you can compare that to like population density and economic uh, issues and things like that. So it's really interesting. So we have all of these tools in place. Yes, and we do use them. But however, when what we found when we got Canopy was since we're down at such as micro scale, this small little seven square mile area, we can't really focus. It's very difficult to pick and choose, even with that level of detail, how we can manage that level of data because whether we're doing something up in this part of town or down in this part of town really doesn't make much of a difference you're talking about like 0. 0.000 decimal points of change with you know diversity canopy cover etc but it's still a very useful tool to have to quantify to uh managers stakeholders city council etc so uh sorry for that long-winded uh answer but yes we're doing it <laughs> <laughs> no worries um Okay, another question for Maria. Um, this, uh, this person said, thank you for your presentation. I am the acting city forester for the city of Thunder Bay, considerably more north than Shoreview. I'm gonna take that, that's Canada. Um, how rapid is the decline in the average ash tree for you? We have corroborated some evidence that the larvae may spend an additional growing season under the bark, which may lend to greater systemic pesticide efficacy. Great question. And to be honest, I don't really know. It's again, we've had our lash for since 2011 and there's been a number of trees that we have either treated and have lasted this long or are still doing fine. And there are also some trees that we've been monitoring that are in poorer health for the last five years, but are still sticking it out for some reason. And we don't know why. Um, but I don't, that, that makes sense. It's, it's especially with the drought and like all insects, they can adapt and adjust to the environment. And if larvae can overwinter or spend another year underneath the bark, that makes a huge difference. And I, again, I, I think kind of like I mentioned in my presentation, we're getting to this point right now where we're really starting to see these ash de uh, deteriorate very, very quickly, um, whether that's the case or not. I guess I haven't been able to look at much research and we haven't been able to do much, again, it's just myself and another coworker in our department. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely become a problem. And I, I think that's definitely, you know, that that definitely plays a part in it. And it's, yeah, they are declining very, very quickly. And it's again, in that point in that death curve where we're hitting that peak and it's either gonna plateau or plummet pretty darn quick, quick here. Yeah, that's a big thing. I think uh, sometimes I, I can kind of chime in on that question a little bit. Um, in kind of these newly infested areas, sometimes what they found is that EAB can take more than one season to kind of complete its life cycle. In those cases, then it's not uh, producing as much on kind of an annual year to year basis. What we find is that as populations increase, um, that will kind of go into a more univoltine cycle where it's every year. And the biggest thing with emerald ash borer is it's such a prolific reproducer. Um, you know, one emerald ash borer, one female is going to lay about kind of 80 to, to 90 eggs and about 90% of those are viable of which, you know, 50% are female. And uh, when I've done presentations around emerald ash borer in the past, kind of walk through the math with this and, um, when you start with one emerald ash borer that you know lays those eggs in five years time, you're dealing with you know a couple hundred million, um, and that's if like you know left unchecked. And so that's that's how you know that EAB death curve happens because all of this happens so rapidly. Um, and so it's you know once you discover it, usually once you start seeing some of those visual symptoms, it's already probably been there for a couple of years. So proactive management plans are pretty important. Um, Another question that I have on here, um, how did, and this is kind of for everyone, how did you deal with opposition to your plan, um, whether it be or, within your organization or external? Um, you don't have to kind of reveal any names with this, but any sort of real life stories are would be great, um, just because I'm sure that as others have encountered, um, there's always gonna be pushback somewhere. Uh, you know, um, I was a field manager when, uh, 
uh, the rest of my colleagues of uh, the forestry management team was working with uh, budget management office, council, things like that. And the only pushback was they kept asking, you know, um, they kept um, asking for more, you know, more iterations of a plan, more iterations of a presentation, more iterations of whatever. But what I remember is this, because I was more on the slant, again, on the field operations part. And I, I dug into Deb McCulloch's work and I said, this is what we're doing out, out in the field. And it was a present, it was in um, at a conference that my predecessor went to and they asked like, what's, what are you guys doing out in the field? What are you doing in your parks? And, um, and my predecessor told him and go, wow, don't you think you're pulling the trigger really too fast? I mean, you're, you know, why are you going to start spending all the money on treatments? You don't even know it's here yet. And then my predecessor basically, so that, that, that was the pushback, right? Everyone else is going to wait. Why, why is not Denver waiting? And my predecessor simply said, because Mike says there are freaking trees and we're going to manage them the way we want to manage them. So that was the answer. Like you have to make a decision, right? Wrong or different, right? You're going to make that decision. So the only pushback was, um, you know, it's, um, was like, you're going, you're going too fast too soon. I don't think so. Not what we learned from Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, for us, um, the, the public kind of just listened to us and the general sense around here at that time, from what I recall, again, I was not in uh, that management role at that time, but the sense here was the efficacy was still unknown. At least the, that's the general message that we were getting. And now in retrospect, it seems silly because there's a number of communities around here, Naperville for one, um, and Milwaukee got ahead of it, uh, who did treat and, you know, they were successful. But the majority of us around here were just, you know, it's here. Oh, no, let's talk about it. Now it's way too late. So all we're left with is, is removal. And the, the, we really didn't have too much uh, pushback. And what we did um, in Park Ridge, at least, is the, it's kind of like a more upper middle class community. So people have a little bit more money in their pockets to play with. So uh, a number of residents treated on their own um, for a number of years for the for the city owned trees in the parkway. And then um, again, we picked that up just last year again. So um, it's, it's really interesting. I think that's just like the big, you know, there's obviously vocal minorities and pockets here and here and here and there in different communities. But for the most part, it was just accepted. And that kind of to bounce off what you were just talking about, Eric, with um, how quickly they, they reproduce and how it can get out of hand. So in our area, you know, we're very close to Michigan to begin with. So it got here really quick, three years. And then we have this huge species load, right? And with that huge species load, obviously the infestation is just going to explode. So by the time where we're all trying to figure out what's going on, it's like, it's way too late. So again, what Michael is doing and what he's trying to preach, being proactive is an incredibly important. So then hopefully you don't have to deal with too much pushback. And hopefully the pushback is problems uh, like he's describing where it's like, okay, let's slow down with the money a little bit. But it, it can at least be quantified by looking at what we did here in Chicago, which in retrospect, I think was slightly a little off. But again, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in and say really the only pushback we've gotten here in Shoreview has been really from residents and that was more of they were on board right away with treating and you know with with what's going on and what the state was doing our council was fine with it if anything now it's more of we're doing too little um, we're not treating all the boulevard ash trees we are not taking down all ash trees in a certain zone um, and mainly a lot of it is budgeting issues. We budget for a certain amount each year and we have to abide by that. If we go over, I mean, I can get in trouble. Um, it's, it's, there's certain, you have to balance it, it, it all. And as much as I would love to go and do a bunch of stuff and have a super big plan, um, I mean, unless that plan is, unless people know about the plan and the city council approves that plan, again, because we are changing our, 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 our plan now, kind of like you had, had mentioned, Mike, of you reevaluate and you re, re, relearn, you adjust, and we are doing that as we are seeing things, hopefully as a preventative measure, some of it as a responsive measure. 
but it is, there's still a balance. We can only do so much with, with what we have. And if anything, that's been more of the pushback from residents is that we are not doing enough. And again, kind of like I mentioned before, there are some residents who had no idea that you Ashford was here, which is surprising, and that they're trying to jump on now and it's a little bit too late and they're upset about that. Um, but I can't do much about that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, I mean, education is just so key. Uh, so I, I, I can, you know, speak from an experience, um, a, a former boss of mine when I was at UW-Eau Claire, and Eau Claire is about, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours away from the Twin Cities. Um, EAB was recently confirmed just a couple of years ago over in that portion of Western Wisconsin, so relatively new, and it was actually found on campus. Um, so fast forward, uh, you know, couple of years, and this is just last year, I met up with uh, one of my old bosses back at the university and told him what I do for a living. And he's saying, hey, I have I have an ash tree in my, my backyard. Um, you know, I was I've been wondering, like, it's been looking a little off. Uh, I'm wondering if I should do something about it. Like, well, hey, do you have, do you have a picture? And he shows it to me and it's got 10 percent canopy left. That's uh, and that that's the issue, though, is that the general a homeowner who doesn't know about this, uh, they're not going to be giving you the calls when it's between that, you know, 10 to 30% canopy decline. They're giving you the call when it's dead. Um, it's just have suckers coming out of it and saying, can you do something about it? No. no. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's funny you say that, like, you know, we, we talk a lot about like education and right and how we need to educate people so they understand what the hell's going on. Excuse me, what the heck's going on. And, uh, it's funny, like the generation before me, they'll, they'll be, I'll be, you know, I'll be on the phone with a resident and they, they want to tell me about how, you know, they were growing up in town and how there used to be all these great Dutch elm trees. It's like, we got to learn from that, right? Like th they weren't Dutch elm trees. Like, so let's try to, it's been, you know, 30, 40, 50 years that we've been dealing with that, that whole generation we missed. So let's jump on this young generation and teach them something just the, the little bit of seed that they need to look for the simple thing like that like yeah your tree is uh it's pretty much gone <laughs> if it's got 10 percent canopy left right yeah i and i i need to re-familiarize my myself with uh kind of some of your public education efforts that you did mike for the city of denver uh gotta say i love the name that's uh that's a <laughs> Well, now, now there's one uh, from the, I believe the Colorado State Forest Service, actually from the response team, it's called Your Ash is on the Line, which I also think is very clever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, and actually with that, uh, for you, Mike, um, so comment on, comment on here. Um, this person is the certified arborist for Jefferson County Schools, uh, County bordering Denver, and they've been treating yep. the ash north of 6th Avenue since 2017. Good. They recently brought in their treatment zone farther south, and they just wanted to say that they're really glad to hear that you guys have been treating for so long. Well, my uh, tell, uh, well, Michael, Michael McLaughlin, uh, my kids go to Jeffco School, so if you want to keep going south, farther south, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate it. Anyway, yeah. Well, and uh, with that, Mike, um, we're so I mean, it's it's one of those things where like, I haven't heard that it's you know been confirmed in the you know the heart of Denver just yet but uh where where's the closest known infestation currently uh Arvada in the northwest uh just northwest of Denver uh uh county line about two miles actually I mean we've all all staff my predecessor you know for the past fight we all think we have it we just haven't found it so but like uh like a previous um I think it was Ryan, the, our SLAM program is very aggressive. Uh, I wrote down some notes. I don't know how many people are still on the low, oh, 113. But uh, I mean, our right away ash trees, we, we treat 28%. And then our parks and parkways, we treat about 42% of our ash trees. So we're, again, we've been very proactive. We've been very blessed <laughs> and lucky with the budget. So I, I feel for the folks that have to be more creative than I have to be if you're catching my drift. <laughs> yeah. And so we have another question for you, Mike. Uh, and this is from Christopher Rasmussen. He's with the city of Dallas. Um, said with adjacent property owners being responsible for removal of dead parkway trees, have you had to deal with any litigation cases? Uh, 
Well, we don't have EAB, so I'm guessing I'm going to take this as a general question. So, no, uh, we also have forestry inspectors and we go out and uh, give uh, notice of violations. I would prefer notice of corrections. I think violations a little too heavy handed, but that's just me. Um, so we actually go out and inspect our right of way trees. We also have parkway trees, which uh, the field staff uh, will uh, maintain. So, um, but to answer your question directly, not yet. And the and that uh, that our ordinance have been in place. Uh, our, our actually our ordinance vegetation ordinance came out of the Dutch elm disease back in the seventies. So um, um, that's how long our ordinance has been in place for inspections and things like that. It's been in place longer, but for inspections in particular. So no, not yet. Sure. Um, and one of the last questions I had is, uh, so for, for Mike, you were kind of talking about what to do with some of that ash waste, um, you know, how you handle that. Uh, so for Maria and Joe, um, you know, how have you handled that in the past? And Mike, I'll let you go first. Uh, well, like I said, we've been, uh, we've been um, re-utilizing, uh, we call it, but just grinding mulch, right? And all that mulch is a benefit to the community. Uh, other agencies, other um, governmental agencies. I mean, it's free for the taking. Um, but we've always, uh, all along, even before EAB um, showed up in Boulder, thanks Kathleen, if you're still on the line, uh, but um, not, not that it was Boulder's fault, but anyway, um, but we've always wanted to kind of repurpose, not reutilize, but repurpose the log. So it's, you know, can we give it away? Yeah, we've gotten it okay to do that, but um, which we might just end up doing, but we want to do something more. We want to get in the hands of craftspeople, tradesmen, even other city agencies that do, you know, maintenance work around the city. You know, just get the wood. And I don't know if there's cost saving. I know there's not much of a market out there in Colorado for that, but we're going to do our darndest to make it happen. So I know Kathleen, I think, has a, a fairly active um, program if she's still online. But anyway, thanks. Go with Joe. All right, I'll jump in. So yeah, we in, in Park Ridge in particular, we didn't really have any kind of system in place. Um, it's something that we'd like, we would have liked to do. And even with all, all, the, all the trees that were removing, um, we looked at it a little bit. Part of the problem was that, that we weren't able to, us as a municipality, weren't able to plug the hole is, you know, we pay a contractor an inch, a DBH inch price for removals. And that includes cutting the tree down and hauling the logs away right so to get an intermediary in there to try to find that way that to utilize it somehow it would actually cost us more so it didn't unfortunately work out for us it worked out for me personally because sometimes i would have some firewood for my own house to split which luckily was in a quarantine zone we've already blown through it but other otherwise no but there are some local companies here like kramer tree uh, out in West Chicago and a uh, hoppy tree service up in Milwaukee who have some urban wood utilization, uh, utilization, uh, programs in place where they actually, the trees that they're removing, they have milling and everything, uh, on that they have at their, at their shops and, uh, you know, resell the wood to local craftsmen, furniture makers, or just the general hobbyists. So it's kind of like great that these, uh, smaller companies, like, well, they're actually large companies, but that the private companies are starting to take over that because again for us the the problem was figuring out that that uh cost balance between how, how we have this money to manage the urban forest it's difficult to spend more to try to give it or you have somebody else utilize it you know so or we just tell the re if a resident wants it we tell them hey you got to stop the contractor while they're out there and let them know you want to keep it for yourself but that's pretty much it for us unfortunately yeah I'll jump in there. Ours is pretty much the same as Joe's. Uh, we, again, we have that budget to work with and with our private, with our contractor who the state contracts with, they are paid, like Joe said, to, they are paid per inch to take it down, to remove it, to haul it off site. What they do with it afterwards, I'm sure there are uh, programs that, that small companies can actually use and what they do with it. I know a lot of it goes into chipping and used in possibly mulch as long as it's debarked and treated. Um, but in terms of here, it just isn't something that we um, 
it's it's an area that we didn't really want to go into, mostly because also we don't have the facilities. We don't even have our own yardway sites. That's through the county. The county wasn't accepting anything because they're removing all of their trees. It just again, it's a balancing thing of what do we have versus the programs that 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 we could provide. There really wasn't an option for us to to do much with it. So it's it's up to the contractors as to how they want to to get rid of it as long as it gets out of shore view we're all good yeah um the other thing i could just just come into the top of my head right now is uh city of rochester minnesota um their forester is jeff haberman um and i, I don't remember the exact kind of specifics around it but they had a cool thing at uh, just again in some of the downtown area. They are doing a lot of kind of like renovations, putting in some like benches and whatnot with reclaimed ash wood from the city itself. Um, I thought that was kind of a unique thing to start utilizing some of that. And I know I've seen presentations that he's done before, and uh, some of it's pretty cool. But in order to implement something like that, you need to have the, the budget, the resources, the um, and all that stuff. But I hear you as long as a uh, it was as long as it's included in the contract to get rid of it and what's done with it afterward, you know, hopefully something nice. <laughs> um, great. Well, we are right about at time right now. So thank you um, to the panel for coming on today. I really, really appreciate all of your insight. Um, I think this is really beneficial for people to hear. Um, and then with that, wanted to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. If you haven't already, you can sign up for some of our other upcoming webinars on rainbowecoscience.com. Got a great lineup of other PHC topics and speakers coming up. Um, so we hope you'll be able to join us for those. Additionally, with it, uh, one of the big things that we're doing is so this one was centered more around emerald ash borer management but um, coming in june i believe june 14th on tuesday we'll be doing one about spotted lanternfly management from a municipal perspective and that's probably going to be kind of the next big invasive thing now while it doesn't have um, you know kind of the economical impact and that emerald ash borer does I mean, it's not usually going to kill the tree outright. It's a big nuisance pest that is spreading pretty rapidly. So it's going to be a good thing to um, be aware of. Again, that's going to be on June 14th. Um, last thing that I wanted to bring up is uh, just a couple of plugs around for Society of Municipal Arborists. Uh, the Municipal Forestry Institute is a game-changing high-level training opportunity in the leadership and managerial aspects of urban forestry. forestry. This is a week-long intensive program that delivers a kind of one-of-a-kind opportunity to grow a more successful community tree program. It's a place to learn and master leadership, as well as uh, management skills for program administration, coalition building, strategic thinking, program planning, and public relations. Uh, this year, MFI is going to be held in Bowling Green, Ohio, and it's going to happen in the last week of September. And so if you are interested in this, there's you can find some more details and registration info on the website. And lastly, with uh, Society of Municipal Arborists, wanted to do a plug for their annual urban forestry conference and trade show and that's going to be held in seattle washington this year it's going to be happening on november 14th and 15th in conjunction with the partners and community forestry conference this is really kind of a great way to learn and network um, and this year is going to focus will be on the successful melding of trees and infrastructure and on building partnerships between municipalities and nonprofits to further tree canopy goals and so more details can be found on the SMA website. And I believe Joe Hansen is actually, I believe just last year you spoke at that. Um, so it's a really great event for this industry.